Next, we have uh, Jose, who uh, joins us here from Los Angeles and who's in total spending more time on the airplane than uh, in Prague, I think, on the, on the way here. So Jose is joining us from uh, USC in, uh, in Los Angeles. Do you mind if I sit? <laughs> um, so thanks, thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Gilles. Thanks, Martin. Uh, and, and the people from the gallery for for dealing with the complications of setting everything up, um, but everything seems to be working well. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and, and, and share with you some ideas. Um, so I'm going to be showing you some of the motivations behind the, the piece that I, I sent to the biennial. It's a, mostly a video of, a, of the latest video game I've been working on. Uh, and there's several motivations that had led me to be doing video games and architecture, I guess. Uh, uh, so I guess that we'll have to explain that in some capacity. Um, many of the ideas, again, uh, that I've been working on, I'm trying to put into written form. Um, I'm publishing a book next year called The Architecture for the Commons with the public, uh, publisher Routledge. So hopefully you, you can follow some of those ideas there. So I want to start with the idea of, of dimensional coordination. Um, we, I think that this, this is a concept that, that was certainly developed over the 50s and the 20th century in general, um, but I think that it's, it seems quite radical today to even think of, of, of a project of coordination between different groups of architects. Um, Christine Wall uh, wrote a book uh, called An Architecture of Parts, and she's trying to kind of document the history of uh, the modular society and how modular architecture uh, actually gained some traction and was uh, utilized by industry to standardize um, different building components in architecture. Um, so there was, in fact, a society called the Modular Society, and they were attempting to coordinate and um, have a module, in this case a four inch by four inch module, that everybody, ideally, they would advocate that everybody should adopt, every architect should adopt, a, so that we could actually coordinate our efforts. So if you're developing a door or a wall, uh, those would actually fit into one another uh, nicely and there wouldn't be a waste of material and would, you would reduce cost in, in many different ways. Um, so wall definitely develops a critique of this, this uh, influence, but revisiting the ideas of the modular society today, and I think that I, I draw the distinction and similarities to what uh, today we're calling the discrete, or, the, or a group of people that, are, including myself, are, are discussing discrete architecture. Um, it seems that a, a project of coordination seems to have a great value. Um, critiques, the critique from Wall has to do with incongruences between uh, the ideals of modularity and in the implementation, and, and the blindness from architects that were thinking of, of abstract models that would have nothing to do with, with labor, or as she would say, bow tie wearing architects in a way. So just to demonstrate the separation there was between um, the, the ideas behind the modular society and the actual implementation. I would suggest that there's a larger critique that, that that's such a project, uh, the project of modularity, and hopefully the discrete project can actually do something different, uh, was a project of homogenization. Right? One that was trying to kind of create a framework for coordination, but it was more of a constraining jacket where everybody would have to fit into this kind of four by four inch module. So I, I definitely think that we should revisit the idea of dimensional coordination. First of all, that idea suggests that we need to work collectively. We cannot just have independent agendas, but our agendas kind of interface each other. So discrete in my view, or the idea of discrete architecture, has that capacity. It doesn't have the capacity necessarily or, or enforces an idea of, um, let's say, homogenization, but it could actually create coordination among different parts, right? We seem to be scared of, of serial production um, since, you know, people like Nary Oxman and many others have demonized the mechanization of uh, of, uh, in this case, the automobile. Um, and there's certainly been kind of uh, histories in architecture that, that, that uh, taking that model into, into architecture doesn't, hasn't worked, right? Like uh, the experiment or the, the startup that Grok used had with Conrad Batsman uh, with the panel, uh, General Panel Corporation was one of the examples that demonstrated that 
I mean, they had the whole factory floor laid out. They had the capital to kind of implement and, and mass produce housing. And th that didn't really work. Um, it didn't, it wasn't able to scale up uh, the, the production. And perhaps we can think that the, that project has taken a lot longer to actually be implemented, not that it necessarily failed. Um, we're seeing today, uh, and I think that has been mentioned by other people, Gilles, uh, Molly, had, they're very close to the idea of automation, but I've been studying closely the, the notion of vertical integration, um, which could be understood in the work of uh, Elon Musk with the Tesla factory and also with SpaceX. Some of the biggest innovations that SpaceX is doing today, it's not only the fact that they can actually land ro uh, rockets back in Earth, but it also has to do with the centralization of production and vertically integrating the production of a rocket. Right? That means that vertical integration means that you can cut the need of suppliers and you're kind of basically bringing them into a, one larger production facility. And in this case, you can actually optimize what would otherwise be the coordination of, of parts developed by different people, those could be streamlined and produced internally. An example of that is a company like Relativity. This is a kind of a space engineering company that are using 3D printing to one of the products that they have currently, it's called the Eon, Eon One engine. And as they advertise it, this is a metal 3D printing engine that drastically reduces the number of parts that you require to build an engine. One of the big difficulties and the failure that engines would actually have has to do with the, the, the number of components and the complexity of actually building one of these engines. So the fact that they could actually 3D print in one go most of the, the parts of this, this engine, it's a great uh, benefit for them. The problem as well with this is that we are starting to see what, what, what does it mean? What is the implication of, of reaching to these degrees of optimization, right? We, we certainly can reduce certain costs and um, we can actually centralize production, but that kind of has risen to kind of greater forms of capital, which has a physical representation in these kind of contemporary forms of factories, the Tesla factory, again, uh, quite a literal representation of, of this vertical integration process. The architecture of Apple seems to suggest also a, far, a form of closed ecosystem, right? Large concentrations of capital and knowledge that are kind of um, speciated, speciated, if you want, from uh, a general context through not only their architecture, but also their kind of IP protection and copyright laws. We've been talking a lot about Katera. Katera is one of those companies that actually is trying to do that in architecture. Um, um, I had the chance to be in a panel with uh, people from Katera and also from WeWork, and we discussed this issue, and they're precisely using the, the vertical integration model as their, uh, you know, the advocacy model, right? I honestly want to just make clear here that I'm kind of trying to oppose that model. For me, the vertical integration model is incredibly problematic. Uh, it's definitely reducing the barrier, it's increasing the barrier of entry for any architect, any designer, any manufacturer, and it's actually uh, allowing for a very selective group of people to kind of uh, deliver what should be our living uh, conditions. Right? So, as we've been discussing, the options that Katera give you will probably be the only options that you'll ever have. A few parametric variations here and there and some colors, but that's it. Um, in architecture, we've, we haven't been talking too much about vertical integration. We have been talking about parametrics, I guess, for the last 20 years. Um, and that has come with what I call a dissolution of tectonics, right? We, we don't longer need bricks or elements. We can actually fuse together parts uh, what we describe as the continuous model that lives in opposition to the discrete. Right? People like Reclin with the like composite deposition or Neri Oxman with like multi-material 3D printing and Saha Hadid using similar techniques. Um, the dimensional coordination that exists within an algorithmic project, like here I'm showing like Mark Horn's work, um, exists precisely between pieces within within a company or a kind of a a particular kind of a proprietary logic, right? So all those pieces can actually talk to each other, but they cannot talk to the external world. Um, and again, the idea of the dissolution of tectonics has come with itself uh, a much higher barrier of entry uh, 
for, for designers. So how can discrete architecture become a project of coordination? And, and that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm not interested of how the discrete actually suggests like new aesthetics um, as much as it might do. I think that the, for me the, the interest of the discrete agenda is kind of how to address a project, re revive a project of coordination among architects. Um, and I try to reflect that my own work, uh, projects like the Bloom project uh, that I, I developed in 2012 uh, together with Elisa Andrzejk, uh, were first iterations of starting to think, well, can parts, serialized parts that are done, uh, in this case injection molding, all the parts are exactly the same, but parts could actually become different by their aggregation. Um, future projects and a recent project that I, I developed uh, were inspired by these kind of pieces, these strong, Simpson strong ties, which are very kind of uh, traditional standardized metal joints uh, that you can find in, in, uh, for wood connections. And we designed our own version of, of something that could be serialized, that would um, potentially be used with very also very standardized pieces of timber uh, to create a joint that would um, define the orientation of, of, of timber, mem timber members. Right? So this is a prototype um, we, we put together trying to think that how can we do a, the most minimal intervention um, in terms of serialization, but kind of open, expand the, the, the possibilities of design that not only us as a design team, but also the public would have at the moment of connecting pieces of wood. So I, I start thinking of how combinatorics, right? How do you kind of, the permutation of parts that are easily available and accessible really creates value. The value doesn't come from the, how expensive the pieces themselves are. Those could be incredibly cheap and serially produced, but if they, um, have uh, the possibility to be arranged in kind of interesting design ways. Um, that's, that's where I think value comes from. So we did a, a proposal for the Tallinn Pavilion. Uh, we didn't get the first prize. We got the third one, so it's not gonna be built, but uh, our friend Igor and Sue from, and, and the people from Polygram got the first one, so I'm very happy that, that at least some, some exciting work is gonna be built. Um, so our system was, um, a discrete system using the joint that I just showed you uh, and, and very standardized timber, showing that the system could actually adapt in many possible ways. Um, we really wanted to do workshops uh, with community in Tallinn and also develop a, a digital interface where you would actually be able to simulate um, the different aggregations of the pieces. Um, to make a case out of this organization or kind of public recombination of parts, uh, we didn't do a model like a 3D print that would actually ship and, and would be you know, sent to the exhibition, but rather we, we did a, um, a toy. So this is how the, the, the model was sent to Talent. Uh, we gave them a series of instruction pieces, uh, how to put it together. I don't think they succeeded on doing it. So like the pictures I've seen from the jury evaluating the project seems that they didn't reach what we consider a prototype stage. Uh, they actually did somewhere in between or much less. I mean, maybe Jill can tell us more about yeah, it, I, we spent a lot of time polishing the connections, and I think that, that that's the kind of pre-engineering that needs to be done quite precisely when you do a project like Bloom or a, a project like this one. You, you put all the effort on pre-engineering one unit, but hopefully that unit starts scaling as you, as you start deploying it. Um, so again, what I'm trying to kind of criticize is the, the optimization, the model of optimization of a, sing, of a singular building Right? We, we've been looking today at architecture that seems to suggest a model, well, we can optimize panels. All the panels within a building could be optimized. But how do we move from that idea of optimization to an optimization that could work among architects, among parts that could have different contexts? Right? So if we optimize the collective, we actually perhaps do not have the most optimal building as one building, but perhaps the collective of buildings, and with that, the industry of architecture can actually uh, be optimized, if you want, or be grown uh, as a whole. Um, so I, I found that the, the, the study of platforms, digital platforms, uh, social media platforms, has been a vehicle to kind of create methods of coordination, right? And that's been the reason for me to move into games, and I'll explain a little bit more of that. So what I call a platform, things like Facebook, or YouTube, um, are under huge scrutiny today, 
because of their kind of uh, extractive imperative, right? This is a term by uh, Shoshana Subov, I would say. And it has been brought to the attention by, by whistleblowers like uh, Christopher Wiley, who exposed uh, the events with, uh, with Cambridge Analytica, how like the data from uh, users uh, has been used to kind of uh, persuade political uh, intentions, right? So people like uh, Julian Assange have been for years really advocating uh, for a form of encryption or methods in which we could use uh, to protect ourselves from the coercive power of these, uh, these large uh, platforms, right? And he definitely finds that encryption is one of those ways to kind of to circumvent the problem. Um, platforms seem to have a lot of different problems. And things like Pinterest, uh, at the moment of web architecture, seem to kind of erase authorship, erase uh, provenance. Where does this come from? And, and who kind of, what are the influences start becoming just um, a kind of a boards of images that are usually students don't, uh, or, or anybody, to be honest. Um, would not trace back where, where this kind of origin, the origin stories of some of the architecture or the references that are working on. And I think that that some, sometimes is also problematic. Because provenance, the idea of the origin of data, um, it's a really great way of, of extracting value from people and, and not paying them for it in a way, right? Um, this was very clear in Ted Nelson's uh, original ideas for the internet, which was, uh, an internet using two-way links. This is documented by Jaron Lanier in his book, um, uh, Who Owns, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, um, I'll get back to that. But uh, in a way, the problem that we're facing is that digital platforms have a way of collecting data, but not you know, giving back uh, the value that they're actually absorbing from it. Things like Creative Commons and, and particular licensing agreements between users have been need to be seen as, as technologies in a way. Technologies that advance a form of coordination, a form of uh, maintaining an agreement between uh, different parties, right? And people like Trevor Scholz have talked about uh, platform cooperativism. How do we re-envision social platforms, not with the ethos of extracting value from users, but rather allowing users to can create networks of value where value remains in the hands of those who create it. So these are some of the challenges that I see uh, in platform design. Uh, there's user exploitation, there's an unequitable distribution of power uh, between the platform creator and, and the users. Um, so that asymmetry of power is something that needs to be addressed. And, and some of the possible responses from different people have been Encryption, as I mentioned, Julian Assange, uh, provenance tracking with uh, General Lanier and Nelson, Ted Nelson, the idea of creating cooperatives or, or legal entities where, where people could be part of a legal structure, uh, Trevor Schultz, and general purpose licenses or creative commons licenses, the idea of uh, Stallman and Lessig to, to address knowledge production within digital platforms, right? I don't think architecture has a digital platform yet. We, we are still kind of in the process. There's been examples of things like 3D Warehouse, which works for um, SketchUp and, and Modelo. It's a kind of a private dashboard for, for models, but they're not precisely what, what other kind of social media platforms do um, in their own right uh, for the connection of users and the production of content. And while great projects, in my view, uh, like the WikiHouse or the Open Building Institute have um, an approach towards um, a form of open source architecture, they're using platforms like GitHub, uh, very much um, a version that is generically centered to the production of open source content, um, and it's not linked necessarily to the production of architecture, and, and, and how would that happen? Um, I think that video games, actually, uh, could be one of the mediums that takes uh, a part of the conversation, as games like The Sims and many others have contributed to um, a form of uh, cultural literacy in some degree of, of, of architecture with, with simple build, building tools, urban planning, and so on. And, and, so, and video games are quite uh, well advanced in their, in their exposition to kind of um, internal social networks as well. Um, some of these were the intentions to kind of go into video games. I, I developed my first video game uh, several years ago, maybe five years ago, um, it's called Blockcode. Um, 
and I'm, I've shown this, I think that I came here four years ago and I already was showing this project then, um, but it's a video game about urban um, modeling. You're basically working in a very small neighborhood and you're kind of simulate, simulating a small ecology uh, that could be both urban and um, natural, if you want to use that word. There's kind of organic components and some kind of artificial ones and you are kind of uh, creating a balanced equation in between those units. We use this game uh, for education, for, for understanding systemic relations between uh, building elements, and, and we really try to take it, uh, I mean, to reach um, the general public. I mean, uh, people ask me, are you using this for architects? Like, how do architects play your game? It's like, well, architects have much better tools to, to do all these things. Like, I, I'm trying to address uh, a large population of people that, uh, in this case, are gamers, but they want to uh, have an interest of architecture. Maybe they're kind of in, in uh, moving towards architecture. And I think even if you're a kid that just plays this game and never becomes an architect at all, and, and, and maybe there's some ideas about ecology, sustainability, that could be, that I think, they're interesting to kind of absorb. Um, the larger objective of the game, and which I don't think was achieved with this game, so I'm kind of moving to kind of a, a different new project uh, is to kind of create a, a dashboard for, for simulating and creating diagrams of architecture. So how can you kind of simulate a neighborhood or a small community or basically like uh, create calculations of what are the resources that are necessary for making a particular uh, piece of architecture happen. So the latest project that I've been working on and, and what you can see in the exhibition is called Commonhood. Um, and it starts with the, the idea that all software is biased, right? This is my perspective on, on software. Like you working with Grasshopper, the bias doesn't come necessarily from the tools that you have, but perhaps from the tools that you don't have, right? There's limits to the simulations and the kind of modeling tools that you can achieve. The same thing would happen with Revit. Maybe you have less simulation of certain kind of things, other things get privileged. So there's a kind of an implicit bias to software, right? Uh, it's not explicit because the software is not telling you, hey, this is, this is the kind of narrative that you're entering in. You open the door of Revit and you don't kind of role play what you're supposed to do. But actually video games do so. They, they actually do have an explicit bias. So I'm making a game that has a very, very explicit bias. You are playing, in this case, a form of architect. And, and I'm putting you in the place of not any architect. You're actually building a form of uh, architecture that wants to kind of bring out of, uh, a, let's call it economic struggle, a community that's been um, dealing with uh, economic hardship, right? So in this case, uh, what I'm showing you here are kind of a factory. This is a, we, the game, I'll, I'll show you a bit more, uh, explain how the different modes of the game work. But the game has a mode in which you're playing a story where, where this kind of, you're following a character and another mode in which you're playing a sandbox, which is kind of more of an open-ended tool, um, as if you would have a modeling software. But this modeling software uh, comes with a caveat that it's kind of including certain things that you would normally don't have in modeling software, um, like the simulation of labor um, coming with things like accidents or, you know, uh, you know things that could be conflicts or uh, a digital engine man, might not kind of follow your instructions, right? So. It's trying to consider um, certain parameters that you would often disregard at the moment of design. And what I'm trying to do there is just shifting um, the relevance of form um, over other parameters um, to suggest that, yeah, if we really want to address some issues, it doesn't matter. We're not going to do it with, uh, with a particular form of geometry or getting the right you know, uh, sponsorship or grant but rather we will change it just by starting to kind of uh, bring a cultural, bring down the hierarchy of certain patterns of architecture, right? Um, so what you can see here, it's, a, it's a, still a very early build of what the game can do. We have simple modeling tools, just extrusions and things like that. We have a simple simulation of workers that would allow you to kind of not only have to build everything yourself, but kind of uh, outsource those Agents will actually have a schedule, so they go to sleep, work, get tired, and they have um, their own kind of criteria to perform the, the jobs that you are requiring. Um, the same thing happens with automation. We want to introduce 
Um, the fact that you can actually uh, automate certain processes, it will take time and energy, and they will have their own kind of, uh, you know, uh, resource cost in terms of uh, knowledge and, and capital. And so, in a way, the decisions that you're taking as a, as a designer within this space are always circumventing access or the scarcity of, of resources, right? You can see the whole video in the exhibition. I'm going to just quickly jump through. Uh, how much time do I have? Oh, that's plenty, so we can see it. <laughs> no, well, um, so it's been popular today uh, to start thinking that digital environments could become digital twins of, a, let's say you have a robot, you might want to have a digital version of that, let's say, of that robot to simulate what you're going to implement. It's way cheaper, and if you're going to run into problems, uh, you better run into problems in the digital simulation before you actually execute the program. Um, the problem that I see with these models, uh, as much as I hope that one day the, the system I'm developing could be used as such a, such a um, process, but it has to do with the, the, the sanitization um, of, of what this simulation really is, right? Again, it's kind of um, a tunnel vision just showing you parts of the world that you care about, in this case, the, the robotic simulation. It's not showing you the messiness of how we work. And again, going back to Kristen, uh, Kristen Wall's uh, critique of the modular society, it's like, I'm trying to kind of bring back some of the human problems that are associated with the implementation of technology. That's why um, the existence of a story mode, and the, that's why um, it's not just a game about automation, but, but rather kind of a, an ecology of, of labor, if you want. So that's the way I, I describe it. It's a game about the ecology of labor where you might have to build a tiny house or build certain forms of architecture that have been culturally uh, been responses to kind of economic hardship and, and so on. Uh, and, and what are the kind of the means uh, to do so? So, I mean, this is kind of a rundown of some of the uh, tools that you have in the game. Uh, you can build a workshop. You have all sorts of machines that you can basically uh, set up to work with, right? You don't have any modeling tools until you actually have the machines to, to build them. Let's say, so if you don't have a table saw, you won't be able to kind of uh, cut wood, right? Um, so you need to kind of acquire certain machines or certain tools to be able to model uh, architecture. And that starts putting an emphasis on the uh, capital imperatives that are associated with certain geometry, right? So in the game, potentially later when we have better modeling tools, we're not going to give you, let's say, certain materials or access to certain, let's say, geometries unless you have the tools to, to effectively manipulate those geometries. Um, there's a lot more going on in terms of, uh, as much as I mentioned, the modeling tools are, are very simple, but from the very beginning I wanted to have a tool where you could just very much like Beam, you could actually group things into families, name things. So what we call a wall, it's a convention, right? So where we could actually group um, all sorts of different elements in different organizations and give them whatever names, right? So the, the, the game is really trying to create a social network where people can share uh, patterns of architecture or patterns of materials that are conducive to architecture in many different ways, right? And hopefully uh, a social network will be able to sort or uh, organize what is most uh, relevant to the community of players using them. Um, what we are doing behind the scenes uh, in the game is kind of storing players, uh, modeling actions. We're not saving geometry. So a JSON file will actually save whatever the player is doing. And that allows us to recreate geometry from scratch um, as opposed to, I mean, in a step-by-step -step process. It becomes almost a tutorial for another player. You can actually follow step-by-step -step what another player has done, right? So this is a quick example of how you group things, you select things, you give them a name. Um, so, as you can imagine, in a social network, you might actually end up building a piece of architecture out of pieces that have been created by a bunch of different people. So the, the software is also keeping track of who built what, right? So we could actually have a list of credits of people that contributed to the wall panel, maybe the staircase, or the different room models, and, and, and have a sense of 
a different kind of granular ownership, if you want, or authorship. Um, the simulation of manual labor, uh, at this point, is just a calculation of time, uh, as much as the, the, the animation is, is kind of simple demonstration. But it, it, it's got to do with, the, as I mentioned before, the autonomy of these agents. I really want to uh, kind of, like, we, we are working a lot on, on the scheduling and, and their own autonomy. So they, they will have, as I mentioned, like lunch, lunch breaks and a, a lot of different kind of characteristics that they will actually, sometimes maybe they won't show up one day if they're sick and so on. There's, there's a lot that you have to deal with at the moment of, uh, of engaging with manual labor. Uh, and automation, as I mentioned as well. So the game really wants to put you in that situation where you might have to transition from manual labor to automation, and like, what are you, what are your decisions? Like, how are you doing that, and, and why you do so? Um, the final, like, as I was mentioning before, every piece of architecture that we store in, in into the network um, has this kind of instruction, like a Lego, right? Um, so it will give you like a blueprint. It will teach you how to be built, right? Um, so you, you can build something quite complex or a series of nested, very complex objects, and anybody that would download it would instantly have a sequence uh, because, as I'm, the, the data structure behind the the way we store the files allows us to kind of go step by step, and as much as we could just make it appear instantly, uh, we'd rather give you the ingredients in a way to see if you as a player want to take that, that, that design in a different direction, perhaps. Uh, so this is how the social network really works. I mean, this is not fully implemented, um, but uh, we're kind of envisioning to see, give you different kind of um, licensing attributions to the content that you're creating, so incentivizing both Creative Commons production and even potentially a, a, an internal marketplace to the game. And we often like look about how different orientation models, mm, the algorithms that we were using with Bloom, um, allow for like the easy kind of placement of much more complex orientations of geometry, and this is what we were proposing to kind of use in Talent to to kind of connect. The, the production of, of more complex geometrical uh, combinatorial models uh, into a kind of a game environment like this one. So uh, a couple of students have been playing with the game and they've been doing some designs, uh, which I, some of them are obviously featured in the video, um, just some images of that here. Um, so this is kind of a final slide, kind of uh, some of the, the final things that I wanna bring back is that I do see discrete architecture, um, again, as a project of coordination that really tries to kind of not create a, uh, a unified agenda, but rather kind of a protocol in which uh, we could create uh, synergies between each other, right? It, it should be open to the diversity, incompatibility, and incongruences between different architects. So as much as some parts, some models could actually talk to each other, some others might not, right? And that's certainly fine in the framework of discrete architecture. Um, I do believe that we need to kind of move towards more distributed forms of manufacturing. The, the centralized model offered by, by and the vertical integration, it's incredibly beneficial for people that are, uh, you know, at the head of those corporations, but it's certainly not helping in any degree to problems of economic inequality. So I would say uh, that's something to address. Um, and a commons-based value system uh, would necessarily have to maintain the value of, that's produced in digital networks like video games in the hand of users. Uh, so to end, uh, I, I like using this Donna Haraway quote where she mentions the idea of sympoiesis, and, and, and I put it explicitly against uh, the notion of autopoiesis uh, that's been advocated by Patrick Schumacher. And she says, sympoiesis is a simple world. It means making with, nothing makes itself, nothing's really autopoietic or self-organizing. Thank you.